Well, I'd like to welcome you to Future Life Television. As you can see on the screen, Justin Arcutt Stewart is our uh, guest for today's broadcast. But Justin, congratulations on the wedding. I've seen the pictures. You and your bride looked absolutely stunning on the day. No, you're very kind. Thank you very much indeed. You know, we had a lovely time. It's a fantastic small wedding um, uh, in the journalist's church and uh, just off Fleet Street. Um, so uh, sort of uh, back, back to her world of, uh, of uh, trying to find journalists that write the truth. That's why they need a church. I think we'll leave that one there, shall we? I could get myself into trouble rather than you do that for me. Um, can we just look at where we are at the moment? Because these are difficult times. It is wall to wall. Uh, noise on the economy and I'd just like to pick out three things today if we could discuss. First one is inflation which is the headlines on, on, on most of our, our broadcasting um, media at the moment. We got to the point where we were told it was going to be 15% inflation. In the recent days we've been told in January it's going to be 22% and we're going to have within days now a new Prime Minister in place. What would you like on behalf of the UK economy and business world for our new Prime Minister to actually install into um, our UK regimes to get us through this crisis and particularly to manage inflation. And I may mean, I say, I think you're quite right, and I hate using that word crisis, but actually this is a potential economic crisis uh, unless we hand it, care, hand it carefully. Despite all the bad news, there is a way out of this, but it's not easy. Uh, and we've also may always been through before it. So to cut to the chase, really what we have to do here is not the headlines, but just regard to energy costs, which of course are uh, quite uh, appalling, particularly affecting individuals. But more perversely, and more importantly, actually for the British economy, is the impact on smaller businesses. Now, I know you and I over the years have talked many times about the strength of the British economy, with smaller businesses. Yeah. We're really good at setting up smaller businesses. We beat the French and the Germans, put together, brilliant. We're not always very good at growing them, but we're very good at starting them. And they are the biggest group employer in the country. Now, what you've got is a lot of small businesses, and I don't just mean the pubs and cafes, which of course are important, but small manufacturing, uh, retail outlets and things like that. Um, and also some of our small uh, designers and things like that. All the people actually quite often can be not just entrepreneurial, but are doing a lot of the small R&D work. Now, when they're seeing, and have already been seeing, the cost of their power, not just double, but treble, to figures which they just sit there and laugh and say, well, this is just ridiculous. It's not a matter of just, I can't pass on the cost of this. I'm out of business. Um, and you look at the proportion of those businesses, which are now very likely to fail, and then you end up with, they all employ one or two people, those people being unemployed, and everyone's saying, well, I need to work and maybe I have to get a second job to pay for this. And of course they can't because the jobs are just disappearing. That to me is the biggest issue we've got to address because these full businesses don't have any proper caps to the power. Mind you, the cap they're talking about anyway, it wasn't a proper cap in the first place. It's about misleading everybody. So what I actually want to see from our future prime minister <laughs> is a some level of understanding of this. And so far in all the hustings I've stayed awake for, Actually, I ended up going to sleep with most of them, but I did try and listen to them. They actually did not really understand the impact of this. And so I fear um, that they won't take the action. What action is necessary? Very large action on the scale of not just the pandemic, but actually the banking crisis. Let's talk back to this uh, issue in terms of how we try and manage it. The answer is, if we want to support and provide the support for small businesses during this time, and it may take two years or so, and during those two years, we need to be able to provide some support. It needs to be worked out selectively. I have no easy, easy answer for that. But the government can ring things by have further borrowing. And I'm talking about 80 to 100 billion, and you separate it out from the normal gilts market, because that's another issue to discuss. Um, and then you actually deliver that to businesses and individuals to provide that support package. And then the power industry will repay that over 10 to 15 years. So the government gets that back. So they can treat that as a separate part of their debt and not just straightforward government debt. Um, it's dramatic, um, and uh, but it's doable, and it takes a sort of big hammer like that to frankly get people's, not just their attention, but actually international confidence that Britain knows what it's doing. 
um, because as we've discussed before, that vital word is com of confidence is key to an economy, not just domestically, but internationally. And you only have to look at what's happened with the price of sterling, what's happened to some of our government debt, and you realize that people are turning around saying, Britain, mm, I think I'll pass this time. We can't let that happen. I think it's interesting, the comments that you're making here, we have not heard before, so I thank you for those. I'd just like to move on to cost of living, the, the other big noise that we're hearing at the moment. And what we're effectively seeing is the transference of um, fuel costs and things of that nature. Now we're going to have food costs because of the drought, because we have yep. vegetables and the wheat and everything is not in the, in the amounts that we would normally expect in this. So on the basis of this, what is the transference of the issues on food, energy costs going to be on cost of living? But what impact is that going to have on the investment markets? Right. Well, it's going to have, first of all, that transference, particularly on food, is going to be very, uh, have a great impact. And of course, there is going to be more to come because of the impact of the war and of the amount of uh, grain and barley and other things that uh, that uh, area is supposed to produce and export and is going to have real difficulty in doing so. Um, so we've got that issue. We've also got actually the pound is weaker. And that means a lot of the food, we import about 50% of our food, has just got a lot more expensive as well. So we've imported that. Um, so I'm afraid there's going to be more of that coming through. So we are going to see this transferring into the economy and it comes through to the economy in terms of we've got less to spend. Um, people will actually be withdraw withdrawing the amount that they want to try and spend. They'll have less confidence. Extra expenditure on those extra things will be cut back. Um, and I'm afraid for some people this will be extremely painful indeed. And also because of the power issue, this isn't just affecting those people who are, you know, in state of poverty, but actually it's going to affect the British middle class as well. People are suddenly saying, whoa, hang on a second, I've got an Arga. Do you really know how much it's actually going to cost to try and run that? And so I'm afraid it's a much bigger issue than the, really these uh, prospective uh, prime ministers have so far showed that they really don't understand. And I think I'm right in saying that in August, sterling fell four to four and a half percent against the major currencies. Am I right in, in that, that comment? You are indeed, and you see the actually, I saw yesterday we saw against the dollar, 116. To put yeah. that into some perspective, we go back to pre-Brexit days, it was at 150. Um, it lurked to them for a long time, around 125, uh, and then it's been coming down from 125, 120, and now 116. That's a very significant drop indeed, and people looking at uh, UK assets uh, and saying, actually, no, that's not as attractive as before. So I'm afraid we're not winning any friends here. If we want to show some more confidence, you'll see that reflected when you start seeing sterling picking up a bit. And to put it into perspective, the first time I went to New York in 1979, it was $245 to the pound. Oh, the basis no, was okay. very, very cheap on those occasions. Um, Justin, we've just touched on guilt in the first item we spoke about. And I'd just like to sort of get your feeling on this because... What we've seen is the massive impact on gilt, corporate bonds and fixed interest. And I was astonished to see that the fall in the impact we've seen in recent times was the worst since 1773. Now, you and I weren't around there, but George Washington was president in the United States at that point. What impact does this massive fall in gilt, fixed interest, corporate bonds have? And what's the longer term prognosis of the impact of that? Well, of course, remember, all this debt, government debt, post corporate bonds, is actually how we finance uh, our, our deficit. The difference between what's coming in and what's going out. And we need other people to actually buy those bonds. Now, who buys them? The answer is, well, oh, some of our institutions are buy them. Some of them are obliged to buy them as part of their pension plans. Um, and then you've also got overseas, a lot of overseas institutions buy them as well. Remember, the previous Bank of England actually made that uh, quite infamous remark about we live on the kindness of strangers. Well, actually, what he was saying was, of course, actually, strangers overseas people buying our bonds, and we need them to do that. The other person that buys bonds as well, of course, actually, is the government through quantitative easing, rather perversely. Um, but uh, the issue that's really concerned me, I know it's something we've just discussed before, the cost of the debt. Now, I remember we were discussing last year this, and it was about 45 to 50 billion, which is very expensive. It's a very, very big overdraft cost. And to put that into perspective, that's just about the same size as our defence budget. I was looking at the latest figures of it, and it looks as though this year that's going to be £100 billion in overdraft charges, uh, the cost of our debt. Why, why, why has it gone up that much? And again, put that in perspective, that's more than our education budget for the entire of the United Kingdom. Um, and one of the reasons it's gone up is because 
One G. Brown Esquire had a cracking good idea 20 years ago when he said, why don't we include in our government debt index-linked gilts? Brilliant. And of course, that's marvellous when index-linked gilts only have to have 2%. When there are 18%, or as you said, potentially 22%, this is horrendously expensive. Um, and that's one of the issues we're seeing there. So people will look at that and say, hang on a second, you're spending 100 billion just on interest. Uh, how well are you actually organizing this? And by the way, am I going to be buying any more government debt at the moment from Britain? Or should I go and buy Euro debt? Or well, actually, in terms of nervousness, I'll be buying US debt. Um, I'll put it this way, there's no particular reason why I'd find the UK attractive at the moment particularly as most things are pointing towards quite a significant recession next year. Justin, thank you very much for your, pers uh, your perspective on this. There's some interesting ideas that we're not seeing in the mainstream at the moment, and I truly appreciate those observations. So on behalf of all of us at Future Life Television, Justin Urquhart-Stewart, thank you very much for your time. Jill, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure and privilege, and good luck and good uh, my, my kind regards to the team and all your clients. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.